good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing well? It is so good to see you here this morning. Man, it is great to be with you. I tell you, to be able to gather together, to worship together, it is truly a a privilege and an honor to be able to do that together. I want to ask you a question, and I think this is an important question to ask you because it gives you an opportunity just to offer a bit of a testimony this morning. But how many of you are thankful for Jesus Christ in your life this morning? Amen. Amen. To be thankful for Jesus, you know, that's what this day is all about. That's what this church is all about. That's why we are here today to gather together to worship Jesus, to to make much of him, to celebrate him, to thank him for all that he has done for us. Also to just study the word of God and see what the word of God has to teach us uh, as believers and followers of Christ Jesus. Um, Before we dive into the the word this this morning, I want to Uh, just uh, invite you to do something that I think Pastor Ross has been doing for the last couple of weeks, and that is to invite you to pray for our student ministry and our students uh, as they prepare next weekend to uh, go through an intense time of discipleship. Uh, Pastor Ross calls it the weekend, and I think that's so cool. And uh, what, a, what a remarkable opportunity for us as a church uh, to be a part of what's happening next weekend. Typically, when we have these discipleship weekends, uh, you know, us older people, we just kind of think that we're just, you know, that's for the, for the young kids. But this is an opportunity for us to also be praying for our students. And here's what I'm praying and I've added it to the top of my list, but I'm praying that, uh, that our students' lives will be radically transformed by the presence of God. I know this. I know that God is our everything. Amen? He is, he is worthy of, be, uh, uh, of praise and honor and glory, but he is the one that is responsible for our salvation, for our sanctification, for growing and maturing in our faith, and just getting through this thing called life. And our young people need Jesus in their life. Amen. Not more than we need them, but, uh, but the reality is we all need him. And so I just want to say this morning that, that we have an opportunity, church, to just be praying for our young people. I also want to pray for our women's ministry. Uh, March 15th, we have uh, a flourish coming up. And uh, flourish is a great night for our women to come together and to to worship together, to study God's word together, to hear testimonies and those sorts of things. And so we want to pray for our ladies in our church as they prepare to gather for that night and to uh, to study what it means to to really flourish in their walk with Christ. And so we want to be praying for them as well. We have an opportunity as a church to constantly be praying for the people of our church, for each other, for all that's going on, for discipleship that's taking place in men's groups, women's groups, life groups. Uh, It's just something that should be on the forefront of everything we're doing as a church. And so I want to encourage you to be people of prayer. Uh, We've talked about this a lot this year, and we're going to continue to talk about it, just being people who are praying for one another, building each other up through prayer that sort of thing. And so we have a a remarkable opportunity to do that. We're also going to pray this morning that the Word of God, as we study it this morning, it would just penetrate our hearts and teach us something about ourselves, about our church, and about Christ. Ultimately, that's what it's about. So let's pray together this morning, and we're going to dive into God's Word. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity we've had already, God, to just come and worship you in spirit and truth and Lord, to gather in this place together as a faith family, to worship together, to study your word together, to pray together. And God, you are so worthy of everything that we could offer, worthy of every word that we sing, every word of praise that we pray, every word of, uh, of truth that we preach. God, you're worthy of it all. And Father, today as we dive into your word, I pray, God, that you would speak deeply into our hearts, that you would teach us something about ourselves and about our church and about who you are, about your desires for our life. Father, we pray for our students next weekend as they gather together and, Lord, come together for a time of fun and fellowship, but, Lord, more importantly, a time for you to uh, 
engage in their lives, to impact their lives, to radically transform their lives. God, as we know, you only uh, can. And so, Father, we pray for that. We pray, God, that you would move in their hearts, that you would move in the lives of our, our women's ministry, our men's ministry, all the different life groups that we have going on. And, Father, just, God, that as we come together as a faith family seeking to make disciples and be discipled, God, that we would be encouraged by your presence. We love you so much, and we thank you, God, for all that you're going to do in these next few minutes, these next few moments as we dive into your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. So over the last four weeks, we've been talking about, as a church, moving forward. And what that means for us as a church, what does it mean that, that we as a church would move forward. It seems to make sense that we would talk about this this time of the year. We've talked about it uh, starting in January and we're now in February and we're talking about this because this is a new year and a lot of times at the beginning of a new year you talk about where you're headed, what you're doing, where you're going. What are God's plans for us as individual followers of Christ but also what is our plans for us as a church. And so it makes sense that we would talk about moving forward and you know, looking at the early church, which we've been doing as we've walked through the book of Acts, we begin to see that the early church offers us an excellent example of how to follow Jesus as we move forward. As we think about where we're going, as we think about how to get there, we look at the early church and we have this remarkable opportunity to learn from them. The early church was a church that was no doubt, uh, growing in spectacular ways. God was moving. It was a church that was on the move. They were learning a lot. They were also having to face some real hardships along the way, persecution and things of that nature. And so they were going through and experiencing some really difficult hardships. But one of the things that we learned about the early church is that they also were people who stood firm and they they persevered through the hardships that they faced. That's what Pastor Ross was preaching on last week, was just the need to stand firm in the face of hardship in our life. The reality is, as we look at the early church and we think about our lives as, as individual followers of Christ and also as the church, we begin to realize that quitting is not an option. It's just not something we should do. It's something that we need to always think about, standing on the Word of God, standing on the truth of who Christ is, standing firm in our faith. And so quitting has never been an option for us. And as we think about moving forward, we look at the early church because it has so much to teach us about who we are in Christ Jesus now, we, we've seen as we've walked through these last couple of chapters how there were very exciting times in the life of the church. The church was growing. The church was exploding, really. And, and, and as you look around, it's very exciting to see how the church is, is moving in the way in which it was moving and what God was doing in their midst. It was a supernatural movement of God. And it was, it was really, it's really interesting to watch God do and accomplish the things that he was accomplishing. And so it, it's very exciting, but we also see that there were things that were happening, like we've talked about, the hardships, but also things that were just changing as they were moving forward, as they were preaching the gospel, as they were sharing the truth of Christ, uh, the, the church was sort of changing as it went along. In other words, as we look at the early church, it was almost as though they were, they were building the plane as they flew it, right? They were, they were just sort of uh, going along with, with this great commission that God had called them to. That was to make disciples of all nations. Uh, Jesus had told them just before he ascended into heaven, to, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then he also told them that they should be his witnesses as we are. They shall be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so they had this great commission, and they're going forward. 
And what we see is we see the church begin to sort of form. That's why we call it the early church. It's the, it's the, it's the earliest of believers and followers of Christ who are going there and they're making disciples and things are happening. They're facing these hard times. They're not quitting. They're continuing to move forward. But what we begin to see is that with their growth comes a complex set of circumstances or conditions that had to be met. And as we get to chapter 6, we begin to see some of these things unfold. The church dealing with things that they hadn't really thought about, or if they had thought about it, they hadn't put a lot of thought into it but yet reacting in such a way that is very positive for us to understand. It's reacting in such a way that we can learn from it and say, wow, this is who we need to be as, as the church, as a local gathering of believers, a local body of believers carrying out the same purpose and plans that God has given us to carry out. That is to make disciples, to go out and, and to share the good news of Christ. And so this morning, what I want to do is talk to you about an issue, a topic, if you will, that we don't talk a lot about. It's, it's not an issue that we, we cover a lot, but I think it's important, and primarily because as we read through Acts, this is what we come to next, the early church dealing with this. And so this morning, what I want to talk to you about this morning is servant leadership. Now, oftentimes we talk about leadership in the life of the church. But I've attached this word servant to it because of what we see in the text. And what we begin to understand is that God, as he raises up leaders in the life of the church, it is important that we understand that servant leadership is what we are to be if we're going to be leaders in the church at all. And so we're going to start this morning with Acts chapter 6, starting with verse 1. I hope you have your Bibles. Go ahead and turn there with me this morning. Acts chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Now, by the time we get to 6, the church, like I've said, has already grown. People are being saved. People are being baptized. And this is because the gospel was being preached. Lives were being transformed by the, by the power of God. In fact, the scriptures tell us here that many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. So we see that this is a very exciting time in the life of the church. However, there was this issue that we're going to re be reading about here this morning. And this issue was that despite the gospel being preached and incredible things happening, some of the daily needs of people were being unmet. And that's what we're reading about here this morning. So read with me, if you will, starting with verse 1. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve, they summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, that means of good reputation or good character, who are full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man who was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timion, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, in the early church, the apostles were key to what was happening. When we start at Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, we see this amazing thing begin to happen. We see the church which was Jesus' plan for his followers, 
become, uh, begin to flourish. It began to, to really sort of come about. And we see that the people of God, that is the disciples, these men who are just common men, uh, everyday guys, I mean, they, they were just followers of Christ, much like many of us here today. And suddenly these men are emboldened, they're empowered, if you will, to go and preach the good news of Christ, to preach the gospel, and they're sharing the truth of who Jesus was. And what we see is we see this mighty movement of God where people's lives are transformed and people are saved and people begin to to be sanctified by the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. And we see this mighty and exciting movement of God as the church begins to really take shape and take form and begin to, to really happen. And, and as the word is preached and as people are saved and as people are discipled, the word spreads out into the community and more and more people become followers of Christ Jesus. And so it was really exciting times for the life of the church. And the apostles were key to this. They were the ones who were, had, had walked with Jesus. They were the ones who were preaching the, the gospel. They were the ones who were making disciples. But as the ministry flourished, things needed to be a bit organized. Things needed to sort of uh, happen that wasn't happening. And what we begin to see that this text teaches us is that there was a real need for what I want to call this morning servant leaders in the life of the church. Now, the reason I would attach servant leaders to what we see in this text as we see these men raised up that are no doubt going to be men of, 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 of good wisdom and led by the Spirit. There's no doubt that they were leaders. But we see here that the disciples, the 12, that had summoned the disciples to raise up these men or to bring these men, they, they made this statement in verse 2 where they said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the Word of God to serve tables. And so the role of these new leaders were to be servants or to serve a particular need that existed in the life of the church. They were servant leaders. They were called to, to carry out a duty that was very much a need in the life of the church, something that was being neglected in the life of the church. And so they were therefore needed in the life of the church, and they were called together to serve the tables or to serve the, the widows that were being neglected during this time. Now, here's what I want to say uh, before we really dive into this, because there's two primary lessons that we learn from this text I want to point out this morning. But I want to say this about servant leadership first, about servant leaders, if you will. A servant leader is best defined by Jesus. Not only is it, be, is it best defined by Jesus, a servant leader best defined by Jesus, but he is also the perfect example of a servant leader. We think of him today as, as followers of Christ, as our Lord and our Savior, and we often talk about Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We rarely really think of him as a servant, but yet this is what Jesus taught us that, that is very important. I want to show you something here. He says in Matthew 20, verse 26 through 28, he says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What we know as believers and followers of Christ is that Jesus Christ did something really spectacular for us, didn't he? Jesus did something that we couldn't even do for ourselves. Jesus was willing to go to the cross and die on the cross for the wages of our sin. His blood was spilled to atone for our sins. In other words, that our sins would be forgiven. We can't do anything to earn salvation Thus, Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross, was buried in a tomb, and was raised from the dead in three days, having victory over sin and death on our behalf. And so what he says here in Matthew's gospel, what we read is he says, if any of you would be great among you, he must be a servant first. First. 
And I think that's really interesting, especially in a day and a time and an age that we live in today where people seem to be infatuated with celebrity pastors. Have you ever noticed that before? Jesus is saying here, if you want to be great, then be a servant. And in fact, what we see here is that the scriptures tell us that even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He sets for us the perfect example of what a leader really is by being a servant leader. And so here we see in the scriptures where uh, as we look at this text and we think about this text and we think about this idea of servant leadership, we begin to realize that servant leaderships, excuse me, servant leaders, they seek to invest themselves in other people, not necessarily themselves, and all of that for the good of the of the local community of believers that have gathered together in what we call today the local church. So Jesus, he defines for us servant leadership, but he also sets the example for us in servant leadership. Now, let's, let's look at what the passage teaches us concerning servant leadership. As we dive into this, we begin to see that the first lesson that's really taught, and quite honestly, there's more than just two. We just simply don't have time for that. But, but the first one that I want to point out to you here this morning is this, is that the reason servant leadership was needed is given to us. There was a reason, a particular reason that servant leadership was given. And the simple answer to wondering why we needed servant leaders in the church is one that is very practical and it's a very practical need for servant leadership. It says that these men were chosen to serve tables to the widows or to serve the daily distribution to the widows. We have a situation here. Look at what it says here in verse 1 and 2. It says, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. We can only imagine that daily distribution was, was food or maybe some other uh, resources that they needed uh, in life, but they were, they were being neglected from their daily distribution. And so this need was brought to the disciples. Now look at verse 2. He says, And the twelve were summoned, uh, they summoned the full number of the disciples, and this is what they said. They said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now here's what I want to say about this statement that we see in the scripture. And this is important that we understand this. It is important for us to understand that the disciples were not being lazy when they said what they said here. It wasn't that they were being lazy or that they felt like this work was beneath them. Not at all. What this was more about was the roles that God had in, in place for everybody who belonged to the church. And so here's what we begin to realize. We begin to realize that the, that the disciples, they weren't, they weren't trying to get out of the work of, of delivering food to people on the contrary, what they were saying was that their role is to preach the word of God, to share the gospel, the truth of Christ, so that people would come to know Christ, and that what they need to do is raise up others that can fulfill the roles and carry out the gifts that they have been given for local ministry. Now, we understand that today, maybe better than they did then, because we have the whole gospel or we have the whole truth of God's word. And I want to show you something here this morning. You see, it's always been God's plan for the whole body to serve. It's not just that it falls or should fall on the, on the shoulders of just the pastors and the elders and the, the, the leaders of the church. It, it, it's really for the whole, the whole body. And so we see this in passages of Scripture that we have. Starting with 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, it says, Now there are ver a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all. Look at this. In everyone, in everyone. 
to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And so what we're reading here in 1 Corinthians is the reality that we are all called to be a part of what God is doing in this place. It's really kind of interesting how oftentimes the success of the church sort of ebb and flows with the success of the the pastor or the pastors. Here's what I mean by that. If the church is growing and the church is exploding and things are happening, then everybody's so happy with the pastor, right? Everybody's so happy that things are going great. But let people start leaving the church or let the church start sort of going through the hardships that oftentimes churches go through and suddenly what do they want to do? Blame the pastors. Well, the reality is what we see in Scripture the reality is, is that we're all in this together. And so oftentimes, because of the church growing or because of the church failing, has nothing to do with just the pastor. It has everything to do with how the church collectively is carrying out the plan of God and how each of us who have all been given spiritual gifts is using our spiritual gifts to for the, for the benefit of the common good of the church. And when the church operates the way God calls us to operate, that is that everybody is fulfilling their role in the life of the church. When the church operates the way that God has planned for the church to operate, then the testimony of Christ is great and there will be those who are added to the life of the church. Why? Because the church as a whole is bringing glory to God. The church as a whole is testifying to Christ Jesus. The church as a whole is serving one another. The church as a whole is praying for one another. We may live in a day of celebrity pastors and leaders in the life of the church, but that's not God's plan. It never has been God's plan. What we see here is the reality that there are different roles for everyone who is a believer in Christ Jesus in the life of the church. Let me show you another passage here this morning. Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. It says this, it says, and he gave, meaning God gave to the church, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. That would be your spiritual elders, your, your spiritual pastors and evangelists in the life of the church. Those who are preaching the word of God. And he says here, he gave these to the life of the church. For what reason? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's everybody in the church. That is the body of Christ. That is every believer every follower of Christ. And so he gives the spiritual leaders to equip the saints who are the body of the church to equip them for the ministry of the church. And then as we continue to read here, it is for the building up of the body of Christ. When everyone is doing their part in the life of the church, the church will be built up. The church will be Will, will, be, uh, will mature. The church will carry out the plan of God because the testimony of Christ is great. The focus is on Jesus. And so here we see this passage that talks about raising up the reason the servant leadership was needed. Here's the reason, because there was a need. Let me just tell you this this morning, that this, this morning, In this church, there are many needs for those to be raised up as leaders in the life of the church. We talk about this all the time in our staff meetings, the need to have more life groups. Why do you need more life groups? Because you have people who want to be in life groups, and there's nowhere to go. Life groups are full. Life groups are packed out. There's a need in the church, a practical need in the life of the church. And so this is what we see. We see these men who were chosen, and they were chosen because they were of good reputation, they were full of the Spirit, and they had wisdom concerning God's Word. So we see these these spiritual leaders or these servant leaders being raised up in the life of the church. But let me show you in the time we have left, 
what the result of servant leadership was. Because anytime we look at God's people accomplishing anything, we want to see what were the results of them making this move, of intentionally raising up leadership, servant leadership in the life of the church. What was the, what was the, 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 the result of all of that? We see this in verse 7. Look at this with me. It says, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to faith. I want you to think about what's happening here, what this whole story is teaching us. We have a church that's a church on the move. We have a church where there are those men who are faithful to the preaching of God's word. They're on the street corners. They're preaching and people are getting saved. The church is growing. But in their growth, there arises a need because some of the most basic of ministry needs were not being met. And so as this was brought to them, they said, listen, we need to raise up people we need to raise up people that can serve the widows, that can serve the orphans, that can serve the people of the community, that can serve the tables, people who can be raised up to, to carry out a need that is, being, that is being missed here. But what they said was, we need to continue to preach the gospel. We don't need to lose focus of the, of the main thing and, 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 and do this. What we need is we need everybody to do their part. We need to raise up men who will lead others and carry out the basic needs of the church. And then this is what happened. As a result of all of that that was taking place, in verse 7 it says, and the word of God continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. I love this, this verse because it gives us so much about what was happening in Jerusalem. First, the word of God continued to increase. This wasn't just that the word of God was going out more, but the impact that the word of God was making on the lives of people. In other words, as the word of God was being preached, not only were people being saved, but also people were growing and maturing in their faith. In other words, as we think about this, we, we understand that as people grow in their faith, they move from being just simply spiritual babes to maturing disciples. And as they become maturing disciples, they move to multiplying leaders. And as they become multiplying leaders and they continue to grow in their faith, they become co-laborers of the gospel. And so the word of God was, was increasing. It was, it was impacting in ways that we can only imagine. And then secondly, we see that the number of disciples multiplied greatly. In other words, evangelism was leading to salvation. People were coming to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so people were still being saved. People were still being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. People were still being sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God. Disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And then finally, and I like this one a lot, and a great many priests became obedient. We don't exactly know who these priests were, but we do suspect that this was a was an indication that many of the, the Jewish priests of the day were also being saved. In other words, they were hearing the gospel being preached and they were coming to a place where they said, I believe in the truth of who Christ is. And so the point is this, because the needs were met, these basic needs of of ministry by these spiritual leaders, these servant leaders that were being raised up, the church could now move forward with the greatest mission they'd ever been given, and that was to continue to preach the gospel faithfully so that people's lives would be changed forever. Do you realize that most scholars believe that the early church, before it was scattered and before it faced great persecution and, and everyone sort of fled out of Jerusalem, that the early church there in Jerusalem, it's estimated that there were somewhere between 25,000 and 50,000 believers, followers of Christ Jesus, 
What we're reading about is this great movement of God where lives are being changed. And no doubt they would come persecution and scatter them out into the, into the other cities. They would leave Jerusalem and they would, they would flee from the persecution only to carry the gospel message with them. All part of God's plan, no doubt. But we're seeing a mighty movement of God here. The gospel being preached, but yet the basic needs of ministry being fulfilled by the body of Christ and specifically being led by the servant leaders who have been raised up. So the question that we ask at the end of this text and looking at this is, so does the church really need to be organized? Is there a need for the church to to have organizational structure? And I would say yes. In fact, I think that this this passage and other passages that speak on eldership and deacons and all of those things uh, lend to this idea that, that church does need to be organized because it deals with such complex issues that arise as you share the gospel and the church grows. But I would also say that I don't think it has to be as complicated as we sometimes make it. We read the scripture and what we see is we see God is pursuing and, and, and gifting teachers and preachers who will preach faithfully the message of Christ and sustain the church. But coming right behind them is this need where the, where the, the practical ministry of the church is being met because it is being led by by, by men who are not just preaching the gospel, but faithful people and gifted people and dedicated people who have surrendered their lives as servant leaders to lead others, to lead the church, to pour into other people, to serve the tables, to do whatever is necessary to take care of the ministries that exist in the life of the church. And so what do we do as the church? We empower these men. We empower these men. We, 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 we teach them and we empower them to help serve the ministry of the church so that the church can continue to move powerfully into the community and continue to preach the gospel. It's all a part of how God designed things. It's all a part of how God orchestrated things. A little over a year ago, we came to this understanding that we were pretty short on servant leadership. And I think maybe one of the reasons why we were short on servant leadership is because we haven't been intentional enough about raising up intentional, I mean, servant leaders. And so we begin to put things in place to make that happen. Our pastors begin to really focus on their areas of ministry and building leadership and then uh, myself, I started gathering with different groups of men to, to really just look at the scriptures and see what the Bible teaches us about servant leadership. Our plan is to continue to expand that, to raise up servant leaders because servant leaders are what are necessary in the life of the church if the word of God is gonna be continued to be preached. There's this idea that the pastors are sort of hired to do everything. And that's just simply not biblical. It's not the way God intended things to be. Can I just tell you this this morning, that there is not a staff member, not a pastor that you have in this church that can do more. We are at our limit. We cannot do more in the life of this church. It's going to take every single one of us fulfilling the role that God has given us as individuals so that the life of the church can fulfill what God has called us to fulfill. We can't do more. And so as you look at the scriptures, you begin to realize that servant leadership, it may come in all different sizes and shapes and it may look differently in different roles, but the reality is we're all called to serve. We're all called to be a part of something that is much greater than ourselves. And until we understand that, until we embrace that, 
I don't know that we will continue to carry out what God has called us to carry out in this community, in our Jerusalem, our Judea, Samaria, and even the ends of the earth. It's a great task that we have before us as the church. And quite honestly, when you start thinking of of all that Scripture sort of challenges us to accomplish as the life of the church, I understand it could be overwhelming. Could you imagine how 12 disciples felt when Jesus looked at them and he says, okay, here's the deal. I'm about to leave. Y'all have got to stay. And oh, by the world, I mean, by the way, I want you to reach the entire world for, in my name. See ya. And he ascends into heaven. And they stand there watching as Jesus ascends into heaven. Can you imagine how 12 people might have felt and a few other scattered believers who returned to an upper room and all they knew to do, all they really knew to do was what Jesus had called them to do. He says, when I go, go back to Jerusalem and pray. And they go back to Jerusalem and they pray. And this is the beginning of what we know today as the church. A mighty movement of God full of believers and followers of Christ who are faithful to carry out their role as individuals in the life of a local church. So I want to ask you this morning, will you join me in praying? Will you join me in praying? Will you make a commitment to pray with me? about what your responsibility is in the life of this church. I've already thrown out there to you this morning, and it's already at the top of my list, to pray for our young people. Pray for our students. Pray for our leaders who are going to be serving this next weekend and investing their entire weekend into the lives of others. And pray for Pastor Ross and Caroline. And pray, pray for our student ministry as they prepare to just teach the Word of God. But pray more importantly that the Lord will impact the hearts of those students that will be at that event. Pray for our church. And then here's what I want you to add to your prayer list. Pray for yourself. I am convinced that there are some of you here today that God has special place for you in the area of serving the church and being a part of what God is calling you to do. And for whatever reason, you're a little bit shy, a little bit nervous about stepping up and filling that role in the life of the church. I can only imagine that in our student ministry, those that will come to this weekend and they'll they'll be a part of something special that happens this weekend. That there's somebody there. Ross, you may may believe this as well, but I I, I just have to believe there's probably somebody that's going to be at that that weekend experience that has no idea that they're called to ministry, to be a pastor or maybe a missionary. It happens. I can tell you this, when I was in high school, that was the furthest thing from my mind. In fact, when I was in college, that was the furthest thing from my mind. In fact, when I was a young adult, I was happy where I was and God had other plans for my life. Some of you are in that boat right now. So I want to challenge you to pray for yourself. God, how can, how can you use me in the life of the church? What is my role here? How can I encourage the church? How can I help build the church? How can I come together How can I help make disciples? How can I be a part of something bigger than myself? I encourage you to pray about that. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. Our band will come out here and they'll, they'll lead us in our last song of worship. But you think about that today, this morning, and also tonight and this week as you pray. Think about those things.
Let's pray.